evening peoples. I am Pastor Leia and this is my friend Gender Snap here. So welcome back to our living room for our somewhat loosely themed summer series on uh, faith and fiction for our uh, Bible study nights together. So as you may know, or as statistically you probably don't know because in the 21st century this is a slightly obscure story, but today is the feast day of Saint Wilgefortis, who is my personal favorite saint. Uh, so last week we were talking about uh, birds, birds, uh, in art, um, and how they can represent different characteristics and uh, kind of stand in for different uh, themes and, and figures or the Holy Spirit or, or whatever. Um, so today we're talking a bit more about Christian art, but this is someone who is not found in my book of saint iconography, weirdly enough. Um, so, but I do want to start off by talking about um, how objects in art um, kind of are like a identifying code language sort of thing. So, uh, let's say that uh, in the before times when we, you know, had birthday parties, uh, but l let's say that you are at a uh, fifth birthday party for a little girl and it is princess themed. So there's all these little girls running around uh, eating cake and getting sticky and dressed as princesses. So um, if, if you try to address them as the wrong princess name, they will probably be very disappointed in you as a person. Um, so um, how do you know which princess they're dressed up as? So uh, for example, uh, Princess Rapunzel is probably going to be wearing a, a long wig that's probably falling off of her head. Uh, maybe Cinderella is wearing a blue dress like in the Disney movie, or maybe she's carrying around a shoe. Uh, Snow White might have very smudged red lipstick because, you know, uh, lips is as red as blood. Um, maybe Belle is carrying a rose because there's a rose in her story. Uh, Princess Ariel, maybe she's carrying a stuffed fish, or maybe she has like very uh, sequiny a uh, skirt that's supposed to look like a mermaid tail, that sort of thing. So like um, a certain image or object or animal sidekick that goes along with those characters, if you see the little girl with one of those, then you can probably guess which princess she is. Um, so um, kind of in that same vein, when we look at uh, biblical figures or uh, saints in art, um, there's usually something that helps us identify them. <laughs> so like a scholar saint is going to have a book um, a, um, uh, Mary Magdalene, fun fact, is usually presented as uh, being strawberry blonde, which I just love. She was definitely not strawberry blonde, but uh, her hair is her identifying feature. It, not the point. That, that's, that's a story for another day. So how do we know that we are looking at a picture of Jesus? Because we don't have photographs of Jesus for obvious reasons. We don't know exactly what he looked like, and the Gospels don't really give us a physical description of him. Uh, there is uh, an apostrophal um, writing that does describe him in detail, but it's a much later writing and kind of disputed and also not the point. So how do we know that we're looking at a picture of Jesus? Uh, so maybe the painting has a title uh, it like maybe it's in a, in a museum and uh, the uh, the painter has given it a title. Um, maybe um, so uh, halos and art, kind of a, a glowy thing around the head or a, a circle behind the head. Um, often there will be a cuneiform halo. Um, so there's like a circle behind the head, but then also kind of a, a spiky up top and then going out to the sides. So like there's also a cross behind him and a cuneiform cro uh, halo will tend to indicate Jesus. Um, maybe um, there is an action of Jesus performing a biblical uh, miracle. So if there's a figure uh, walking on water near a boat, that's probably Jesus, contextually speaking. Um, maybe like some paintings have labels, especially if there is a lot of people in the scene. So you'll have like a, a crowd scene and a little like scroll that'll be like Saint so-and-so and John the Baptist and Mary. It's less common, but some paintings do that. Um, or maybe there's a context. Um, if uh, there's a guy on a cross at like the, the altar of a church, probably Jesus. There are other saints who were crucified, but contextually speaking, probably Jesus. Um, so those are some ways that you might know that you're looking at Jesus. But hypothetically, let us say that you were looking at an image of a single figure on a cross. For example, my necklace, there's a single figure on a cross. 
it's very small. And even if you actually look at it up close, there's not all that much detail. Um, and maybe there's no uh, other figures or like a background or maybe even it's just like a, cru a crucifix necklace. So it's just the shape of a cross with a person on it. Uh, and there, there's not much detail. And I mean, crucifixion at one point was you know, a fairly common method of execution. So it's not like Jesus was the only person ever crucified. Um, he, I mean, if you're looking at art, most likely it, it's going to be Jesus, but that's not the point. It doesn't have to be Jesus. So without identifiers, really the figure on the cross could be anyone. I'm just saying. Um, yes, St. Francis is usually depicted with a bird. That's a, a nice uh, tie-in with last week and this week and, and birds. Look, bird, yes, but we don't, oh, excuse me, we don't want to snuggle with bird. Well then. Uh, so, and of course, Jesus was not white, I'm just saying, uh, but we do sort of expect him to be just because that's what we're used to seeing. Um, oh, I've got all these images that I meant to be bringing up. So this is kind of a, um, a, a painting of Jesus that doesn't have all that much detail, um, but because uh, he's kind of wearing something around his head, it's probably not a sweatband, he doesn't look like an 80s aerobics guy, uh, it's, it's a crown of thorns. Uh, you probably figure that out from context. And um, the, the label above the cross uh, in the story, it says Jesus, King of the Jews. Um, so we, we can tell this is Jesus, um, but those are kind of subtle indicators. Um, so this is another Jesus we're talking about. Um, the point being that this, this definitely not, not what Jesus looked like for sure. Um, here's, here's another, here's another, uh, Volta Santo. So, uh, we know that this is, is Jesus from context. Uh, so we usually expect him to be white because that's how we're used to seeing him. So like rationally, we know that Jesus wasn't blonde and blue eyed. Um, that would have been a very unfortunate complexion to have had in that part of the world. Uh, as a very white person, I sunburn so easily. Uh, that, that just would not have gone well for Jesus. Um, so um, we, we do sometimes see like a black Jesus or an Asian Jesus or some other kind of Asian Jesus. And like, you know, we know that Jesus came to people who don't necessarily look like us, but it still surprises us a little bit because we're not as used to seeing Jesus looking that way. So. In the Middle Ages, you would have expected Jesus to look eh, some, somewhat like this. This is not, you know, an, an atypical example of Jesus. Um, but what if you saw Jesus looking a bit more like this or like this? What's up with that? So um, thematically, do we focus on Jesus as being human or as being divine? He's both, but it's kind of hard, especially in a painting, to show both um, because Jesus is a very large concept and how do you portray someone being simultaneously very human and also simultaneously very God? It's hard to do in art. So you tend to see uh, one or the other. Um, oh, we want to play with the bird now. I should have put this back in the toy box. Uh, so um, if we're depicting Jesus as human, we might see him in a loincloth on the cross. Uh, maybe he's visibly injured, looking like he's in pain, uh, especially after uh, the Black Death came around. We're, very, we're much more likely to see Jesus looking like very visibly pained and with a lot of uh, physical scars and, and blood and stuff uh, because we as a society were like, oh boy, there's a whole lot of pain and physical suffering going on in this world. It's a good thing that Jesus can understand that. And so Jesus can start to look like a plague victim, which is really, really interesting, sociologically speaking. But again, that's, that, that's another story. Um, but if we're depicting him as more divine, perhaps like in this painting, um, Jesus is going to look more regal, uh, more more clean, honestly. Uh, maybe he's kind of looking sad at the atrocities that humans are capable of. So uh, if you're used to seeing bleeding Jesus in a loincloth, it would be kind of startling to see sad, clean Jesus in royal robes. And you might not immediately think, ah, oh, yes, this is Jesus. And so that brings us 
two fun stories about this kind of image of Jesus over here. Uh, so this is a uh, Volta Santo. Um, so it's more of a specific uh, kind of Italian style based on um, one uh, statue in Italy. This is another uh, image of it. So you see that Jesus is wearing a very long robe uh, that kind of vaguely androgynous looking, kind of lanky, and it's just not necessarily the image that we would think of first in our experience. Um, so this is it, it's also uh, closer more to like the Eastern iconography of Jesus. So, we'll go for this. So once upon a time, as the story goes, there was a beautiful princess, of course, and um, and this is a, maybe in, in Portugal, depending on which version of the story that you're reading. And uh, so uh, her father uh, wants to marry her off to uh, maybe a Muslim king or a, a pagan lord guy or, or the king of Sicily. There's, there's several versions of the story. Uh, the precise details, you know, not that important. Uh, so um, she's supposed to get married to this guy who's not Christian, but she is Christian. And uh, because she is Christian, she wants to dedicate her life to God. Uh, and given the uh, patriarchal society that she lives in, she's probably not going to be uh, permitted to keep worshiping her God if she marries someone who doesn't. Uh, she would be required to obey his religion. And um, really, it's not really like women get all that much autonomy in the Middle Ages because patriarchy needs to be smashed. So she's like, Okay, um, Dad, but could, could I please not marry him, though? Because I would really rather not because I'm Christian and he's not. And I just think that's pretty, you know, incompatible set of differences. And um, can I please just remain single? And her dad's like, <laughs> no, I want the land deal. What the hey? You're marrying this guy. So she prays to God. This is my uh, version of, of events anyway. So she prays to God and she asks for a miracle. Because she doesn't want to marry this man. She wants to dedicate her life to God and uh, have that choice. Uh, but in her society, she doesn't get that choice. So she prays to God and she is granted a miracle. And so she wakes up on the day of what should have been her wedding and she has a full beard. Which uh, is a surprising miracle, clearly miraculous. Um, I have not personally grown a beard. I've definitely worn a beard in a Wilgefortis costume specifically. It was like a sweater on my face. Anyway, um, they don't usually come up, you know, full healthy beard overnight. So, you know, definitely a miracle. So um, her dad comes in, you know, he's going to walk her down the aisle or whatever. He's like, oh my, no, no, this is, no, oh, don't, don't, don't like this. Don't like this. Uh, so her groom is like, oh, I don't like this either. I, I am not marrying your daughter, sir. No disrespect. We can still have a, a, a peace treaty or whatever, but I, please don't, no, 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 I, no, I don't, no. Um, so the wedding is called off. And uh, so the king has a bit of a temper tantrum and uh, he has his daughter crucified, as you do. And so uh, this is the origin story of uh, an image of a kind of lanky figure in a robe or a dress with a beard on a cross. Um, you know, because robe, dress, in, in art kind of a bit vague, and you could, you, you could uh, interpret this um, figure as having breasts. Um, there's kind of some pectoral muscles there, and clearly a beard. Um, so if, you, if your first thought is not, this is Jesus, then it might be, you know, coming to this story of Wilberfortis. Yes, chin scratches, oh my gosh, naggy cat. Uh, so, um, Wilgefortis is her Latin name, which means courageous virgin, or a uh, Vilgefortis, depending on how you're pronouncing Latin. Uh, we literally don't know how Latin is pronounced, but there's different schools of pronunciation, which uh, can get a bit heated. Uh, <laughs> again, another story for another day. Um, but like, uh, even in the Middle Ages, not everyone speaks Latin, so there's a number of uh, different names for her. Um, so in English, you might be uncumber or uh, ontkulmer in uh, Dutch, which uh, both means like someone who avoids something, uh, like a marriage to a non-Christian person. Uh, in German, her name is Kümmernis. I've definitely mispronounced that, apologies, uh, which means grief, which I think is uh, a very 
lovely. I mean, there's a lot of grief in not having autonomy over your own life. And uh, that's definitely a pretty essential theme of her story. Um, in Italian, she's Liberata, which is maybe the, the second most familiar um, name for this character, uh, which means liberated, Liberata, liberated, that you maybe could have figured that one out. Uh, in French, she's Debara, which means riddance, like good riddance, don't want the husband, don't want the wedding, um, which, is, which is pretty great. Uh, but um, I, I first learned about her as Wilberfortis, uh, so that's what we're, what we're going with here. Um, so a lot of female saints are a bit more passive than Wilga Fortis. Like they just happen to be Christian, like in the first couple centuries of Christianity, and um, they are executed by the state because they're found out, not because they did anything, just because the state found out. Um, oh, I keep getting distracted and not showing all the images that I came up with this afternoon. <laughs> Oops. Uh, so um, this is another image specifically of Wilgefortis. Um, like th this is Wilgefortis, but it, it's kind of, if you're not familiar with Wilgefortis and thinking, ah, yes, this is Wilgefortis, you might look at this painting and think, yeah, that's Jesus. Um, because again, this is kind of an androgynous figure. Uh, the robe is very loosely fitted. Um, the, the halo kind of, um, hides the fact that there's long hair uh, coming out from behind her arms. Um, you might not think to look at that. Like, you know, Jesus has long hair, maybe not like, you know, Pastor Leia long hair. Um, <laughs> it's down to my waist. Um, but, you know, th th this could be Jesus if you're not familiar with Wilka Fortis. <coughs> Meow yourself. You know this story. Cats. Um, this is another image of Wilka Fortis. Um, which definitely might strike you as, why, why is Jesus wearing a short dress that is very clearly a dress? Um, but, but again, this is, this is Wilga Fortis. Uh, so this is a, a less vague bit of art. Um, so here is another um, crucifixion scene where, um, it, and this is a, a rather large piece that's in a small format on your screen probably. And so you look at this and again, you could pretty easily assume that this is Jesus. So in this uh, style of uh, painting, um, the figure on the cross is most prominent. It's usually Jesus in this style. And then there are a handful of scenes from the life um, kind of in boxes behind it, kind of like a comic book form. Um, so, but if you look in more detail at some of those scenes, you can clearly see that the, the main character is a woman. Um, so, um, in th this one right here, um, uh, you can see that she's got breasts and there's a, it's clearly a woman in the main um, figures. Uh, there's also, um, one aspect of her story in some versions of the, the tale is that there's a fiddler, a, a poor fiddler who is uh, playing to her as she's being crucified because he feels sorry for her. And, uh, so she gives him one of her shoes and she's a princess. So it's like a, a very nice gold shoe. Um, and so then they see this guy with a gold shoe, this princess's shoe, and they're like, oh, you stole the shoe. We're going to have you executed. He's like, no, 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 it's from the princess. And so then, uh, his one request is that he can play for her again. And, uh, then she gives him the other shoe. And, uh, so obviously he didn't steal the shoe and he was allowed to live. Um, or, um, the, the, the shoes came from a statue of Wilga Fortis and it's a miracle, again, depending on the, the version of the story. Um, so another, um, detail about her is that she might be wearing one shoe and, and it's, a uh, it's gold and there might be a fiddler at her feet. Um, which I, I don't, I personally, I don't think is as fun uh, a part of the story as, as the beard part. Um, anyway, so, and then... This is a particularly nice one, I think, which is clearly a uh, female figure. Um, and just very nice, very nice image. Um, uh, nice blending and also has the, the fiddler at her feet. Uh, so anyway, point being, a lot of um, female saint stories are a bit more passive. So a lot of female saints tend to be uh, the sisters or mothers or close friends of male saints. Um, when I went to uh, study abroad in Rome in 2009, um, I was at a, a papal audience where they were celebrating the, the recent beatification of the 
mother of, I forget who, I only had three years of Catholic school, I don't, I, I don't remember all of them. There are like over 10,000 saints, so I, no one can keep them straight. Um, and uh, of course, uh, St. Clair uh, of Assisi was a close friend of Francis of Assisi, so that's kind of how she got famous. Um, and, and then some of them are sisters. Uh, so quite often, uh, female saints are nuns, which um, I, I love nuns. I've had a, I've known a, a, a few who were I very much um, loved and respected. Um, so and would have would have been one in an alternate universe. Um, so they're uh, not necessarily, though, in a religious life by their own agency. Because, of course, there was a point in life where if you didn't have a dowry to, you know, pay someone to take your daughter off your hands, you passed her over to be a nun. Because, again, the patriarchy needs to be smashed. So there is one, um, I guess we call it trope in uh, saint stories, that is the miracle of the roses. And um, this one kind of gets at me personally that um, there, there's several saints who have some version of the story. And so it's along the lines of um, a woman is uh, giving uh, bread and food to the poor. Um, but because she's a woman, it's not like she's allowed to own property. It's not like she's got money of her own, right? Uh, so she's sneaking it out of her family's uh, kitchen. And so um, one day, uh, like her evil stepmother doesn't want her to be giving the family's food away to the poor. Um, or her husband's peers uh, don't think very much of this uh, frivolous hobby of hers. And so uh, she's asked to show what she's carrying in her apron. And so she drops the apron and what falls out is not rolls of bread, but a bunch of roses. Uh, maybe this is even in the winter, so it's like extra miraculous. Um, and I'm not saying that God can't work in ways that I personally don't understand, but if God is to intervene that directly, I would prefer that it be healing someone who's dying horrifically rather than preventing someone from being put in timeout, honestly. I... But the world doesn't work the way that I want it to, so who's to say that God does not make this kind of miracle happen? Anyway, um, I mentioned that the Miracle of the Roses because this happens in a number of different saint stories. Uh, so that's much more common than a woman getting a beard. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so take that for what it's worth. So uh, in art, um, female saints are almost always depicted as being beautiful, conventionally beautiful, uh, and as being young women. Even if they are young girls, interestingly enough, they are depicted in early art as being young women, uh, which is just fascinating to me. There is um, a very young girl saint, like uh, six or eight or something, uh, Santa Agnese. Um, I was at her basilica in Rome on her feast day, which I happen to know was in January, because that's when I was there. Um, so she was a little girl who was uh, martyred in Rome, but she is portrayed as a young woman, which is just very interesting to me. Um, anyway, so saints are depicted as beautiful, except for Saint Drogo, fun fact, who is the patron saint of ugly people. This is a thing. I am not making this up. Saint Drogo, patron saint of ugly people. He had like leprosy or something. Anyway, um, so there's also very little space in our stories, like whether they are saint stories or secular stories or uh, popular movies, whatever. There's not very much space for women who are not conventionally beautiful to be heroes and there is even less space for people who defy gender norms to be heroes. Um, and so the fact that St. Wilgefortis is a figure and a story that exists uh, gives permission for women who are not conventionally beautiful um, or who aren't really thrilled with the gender binary hey, uh, to exist. Um, she also represents um, women who might have uh, PCOS or hesitism and um, do grow some facial hair because that, that is a thing that can happen, not necessarily to the extent of, you know, miraculously having a full beard overnight because that was a miracle. That's not science. That was a miracle, um, allegedly, because Wilga Fortis didn't actually exist, which is why, as of 1969, she's no longer in the, like, official canon of saints from the Catholic Church, which is immensely disappointing to me as a person. Although, um, like, she, she's mostly a medieval figure, but there were um, chapels dedicated to her even in 1944 was the last uh, chapel dedicated to Wilga Fortis. 
And uh, I mean, I was able to get a St. Wilgefortis icon on Etsy. So um, she's also uh, in uh, Westminster Abbey. I couldn't find a, um, a public domain image of that. Uh, and um, yeah, the one that I took like 10 years ago was very fuzzy and wouldn't have been great on it anyway. So um, she, she's in well, Westminster Abbey. <laughs> she, she's not like, I mean, that's kind of a big deal. Um, yeah, so the fact that she exists is really empowering and is why she is still a pretty popular figure. Uh, one of my favorite um, modern folk songs is, is St. Wilgefortis, which is just so delightful. Um, I should link it later. Um, anyway, and so she is uh, considered the patron saint of uh, trans people, people who are trying to avoid marriage, people who are trying to get out of bad marriages or bad situations more generally, seeking to be unencumbered of something. That was a pun, because remember she's sometimes known as uncumber. Eh. Anyway, that was not my best pun. Um, but uh, so I've mentioned before in a newsletter article that sometimes when I'm stuck on a sermon, I will um, go on YouTube and look for a sermon on that reading. And I will almost never find a woman preaching. And there has been exactly one time that I've found a young woman preaching. And um, I am fortunate to have grown up in a church where it's not unusual to have female pastors. Like I am not an anomaly in the circles I grew up in. Uh, statistically in the world of pastors, Boy, am I an anomaly. Um, but it's, it's kind of lonely to not see yourself represented somewhere. And the fact that until pretty recently, all of the Disney princesses were white. What does that say for a little girl who's not? That the princesses don't look like her. That kind of says you can't be a princess. Like your very white aunt can. Um, and it's important to look for other voices and unusual voices because just because the saints that we most often hear about are uh, conventionally attractive or have um, kind of uh, standard life paths or uh, came from wealthy families or didn't necessarily go against the social norms, um, that doesn't mean that there aren't people who come from different backgrounds or who do unusual or very surprising things. Um, because God created a very diverse world full of diverse people and voices and dreams. And we should be looking for those other voices because God didn't just create one voice or one um, saint trope or one style of story. Anyway, so I love Wilga Fortis because she just really speaks to me and uh, to, to many of my friends for that matter, that she was able to um, be martyred for a choice that she actively made and not that was made for her or that happened by chance. Anyway, uh, I love St. Wilga Fortis. I hope that you at least find her story interesting, even if, I mean, I, I don't expect necessarily her story to speak to you as much as it as it does to me. Um, I, uh, I put together a pretty elaborate Wilga Fortis costume for a, a seminary a Halloween party m many years ago, which of course means that every three steps I took I had to explain to somebody who I was. Um, <laughs> one of my favorite uh, pictures from that night, again very grainy or I would have showed it, um, is me very excitedly uh, explaining a story to some uh, random student and look on his face is, what? pretty much summed up the evening. That and my face being very warm because I was wearing a sweater on my face. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, so today is the feast day of St. Luca Fortis or um, would have been before she was technically taken off the official calendar, um, but she's still a delightful story and I think an important reminder um, that not all of our stories look the same. So uh, she is a fictional character, which is why she's kind of the heart of this loosely themed faith and fiction kind of uh, series. Um, because even though she's not a real character, um, I think that her faith is still inspiring. Um, I'm sure that we all have favorite fictional characters from novels that we would kind of like to you know, grow up to be like, um, or have some aspects of, and Wilga Fornis is mine. So anyway, peoples, I hope to see some of you tomorrow for our Wednesday evening prayer or our session meeting if you are on session. Um, we are also still having our Thursday uh, Zoom cocktail hour if you would like to join us for that. 
And of course, on Sunday, we will be having worship both in person in the sanctuary and also still here online. So in the meanwhile, good night from Gender Snap and Wilga Fortis and me.